Hello everyone, welcome back. Today is Sunday, June the 30th at 1130 a.m. Pacific Standard Time and this is the second class of our Grace free TOEFL test prep for you. I'm Whitney Farmer and again I am so very glad to be standing in front of you today to be able to hopefully help you get from where you are now to where you want to be in your test preparation. What we're going to be doing today is, <coughs> next, first of all I need to let you know that the TOEFL is developed by an organization called ETS, Educational Testing Service. It is not our product. And we, however, are coming alongside many different organizations and people who really want to make sure that this test experience is successful for you. Next. Next. Today, what we're going to be discussing is a little bit out of sequence from what I had planned before. And we're going to be discussing speaking, and we're going to be doing this for the next couple of sessions and perhaps even more, depending on what um, occurs in the conversations on our WhatsApp and our Facebook applications and our chat rooms, etc. There might be more of a demand for it, but what I wanted to do is give you this information first instead of treating it um, as like an intellectual dessert later on. And the reason is, next, that we did this, um, we did a survey online, and uh, this is a reminder of what we discussed last week, but what had happened was more than I expected, two times as many people told us that speaking was your most challenging part of your test administration. And it was a, a two to one margin, and so that showed us clearly that there is an urgent need to get you up to speed in this, sec in this section, perhaps more than any of the others. And that does make sense because all of the sections actually feed into the speaking moment. And so therefore, we wanted to jump on this now. Next. As a reminder, again from last week we discussed, there's going to be a change in the administration of the test. Um, what will be happening is as of August the 1st, instead of having six tests, tasks, you will instead have four tasks, one independent and three integrated, for a total of 17 minutes as opposed to 20. Next. Now what this means is that you'll have less, um, less time that you're going to have to be spending face-to-face -face in that situation, um, but it's still going to be a challenge for you. I will let you know that I am a native English speaker. I was born in America. And on the internet and a number of different places on the official ETS site, there are actually drills that you can do that are free that put you through the paces of what it's like to actually sit in that situation. Um, with the independent speaking, what happens is that you are given a question, you have 15 seconds to prepare yourself and to organize your thoughts, and then you need to speak for 45 seconds. Now, what I found fascinating as a native speaker, I was challenged myself. I assumed that it would be very simply second nature for me to just begin to speak comfortably about the topic, which are very general, um, simple types of topics. But I found when I finished my thought, I looked at the time clock and I still had 20 seconds left or some, of, some amount of time that I needed to fill. In other words, I wouldn't have been perfect in my scoring if I myself took the test. I thought that was very interesting. And what I wanted you to see, first of all, we're talking in this session today about the independent speaking portion. I'm not the integrated. That's a different, a different type of, of testing moment. And there's also different qualifiers that the um, assessors will be looking at you for. So I want to speak just about the independent speaking today. They are related, however. What I have here, I actually have posted this also on our Facebook group as well as the WhatsApp, um, the link to this. This is from the ETS website. This is the independent speaking rubric. 
if you can see that on your screen. It's very dense information and we're not going to be reading each section today. I want you to become familiar with it, however, though. Read each of those sections and the reason that is important is because this will determine your score. When you're sitting in front of someone in that moment and providing your speaking moment, this is how they will assess your ability to speak English successfully in an academic environment. So, since that's what they're going to be testing you on, you want to guide your performance for a maximum score when you go for that test. So the rubric, if you look at it, there is a uh, bottom score of zero, top score of four. The general description says that the response that you give fulfills the demands of the task given with at most minor lapses in completeness and it is highly uh, I'm sorry, highly intelligible. I'm trying to read it with the glare. No, no, my fault. No, no, no worries. We're good, gentlemen. Highly intelligible and exhibit sustained, coherent discourse. A response of this level is characterized by any of the following. And then if you look to the right of that cell on the top row, this shows you a four-point score. What are the characteristics of those in each of the different categories? delivery, language use, topic development, okay? So in delivery, it is generally well placed in flow, expression, speech is clear, it may include minor lapses or minor difficulties with pronunciation or intonation patterns which do not affect the overall intelligibility. All right, so as an example, then you have language use, then you have topic use. Now, what I consistently hear people discuss is how do I develop my vocabulary? How do I do that? How do I learn how to speak enough English to be able to succeed on this portion? I want to suggest to you a different strategy today because there are multiple opportunities to build your vocabulary. There's multiple ways that you can, and we've, been, we've discussed some of those already. On your, on your applications, they talk about speaking with native speakers. Um, listening to the news, uh, reading newspapers, reading uh, different materials in your professional discipline in English, um, listening to music, um, those types of things definitely are going to help and you know those though already. What I wanted to do today was instead shift your focus away from simply acquiring English and instead shift it to the speaking skills that might be able to hopefully enhance and successfully display the English that you've already required. Interestingly, um, this is almost like public speaking. And I'll be really honest with you, every single time that we're preparing for me being here in this class in front of you, I'm nervous. Yesterday we did, a, um, we did a camera check and sound check and I was so in my head and concerned about different things and when I was speaking on camera to you yesterday, I gave you the wrong time that we were going to start today. I said that we were going to start at one o'clock in the morning and, and I'm a native speaker. I mean, and that is a, a catastrophic error. I'm not protected from that. I'm not protected from that. When you have fear, when you get nervous, it keeps you from performing successfully. And that's what I want us to address. Your English, that builds over time. There's no quick fix to that. You must memorize vocabulary. You must take one word and then develop similar words within that context and contrasting words to give an opposition in your speech. You must learn how the rhythm of the language sounds. You must learn where to emphasize things. You must learn how to diminish some of your accent, not to erase it, but to keep those aspects of your accent which are preventing someone from understanding you. Those things, those take time. That takes muscular development. It's neurological development. I can't give you a quick fix for that. However, 
if we look at the rubric, the independent speaking rubrics for an example, this rubric describes three categories, delivery, language use, and topic development. Only one of those is completely and only about the English you've required. If you look at delivery, and if you look at topic development, both of those are dealing with the skill of speaking, public speaking. There have, I don't know if this is an urban legend or not, but I have heard it said that if you take a poll or a, a survey of people on what is their worst fear, and they give you these different fears in their life, some people actually rank public speaking higher than death. <laughs> it makes no sense, but we're, this is who we are. We're emotional beings that are trying to operate in an intellectual way, and you can't, you can't completely dismantle your emotions. So what I want to do today is give you some ideas on how to increase your delivery and how to increase your topic development scores. And both of those might be able to enhance your performance when you, because this, this is a performance. I use that word, I, but I think it's a good word because in a regular speaking conversation, you're just talking. But this is a performance. You need to bring everything that you have front and center in an exact moment for a, a limited period of time. It needs to be as good as it possibly can be. That's a performance. So that's what I want to work with you on beginning today. So next slide, please. One of the things that um, English speakers or writers do is they organize their thoughts in a certain way to guide the audience into their thought to help expand on that thought, perhaps persuade the audience or the listener or the reader as to what is their position, and then they close it up with something that theoretically is going to seal the deal and bring the listener from their position to your position. Sometimes it's a persuasion point, Sometimes it's an educational moment, but there is something that I have and I want to give to you and I want to bring you into it. And so how you organize that is how you can organize your presentation when you're doing your test assessment. This is one example. It's called a syllogism. I'm not sure if you've heard this term before. It's oftentimes used in the realm of logical reasoning or logical assessment. Um, a syllogism is an instance of a form of reasoning in which a conclusion is drawn from two given or assumed propositions. And then at the end of it, it's all brought together. Um, th let me give you an example of one. Um, in my family, you roller skate until you break a leg. And until that happens, you should be expected to roller skate. I, as a member of my family, have not yet broken my leg. So therefore, right now, I am still expected to go roller skating with my sisters. <laughs> that is actually true. All of that is true. My sisters, we all have roller skates. And until I break my leg, as a member of this family, I am expected to go roller skating with my sisters. That's actually a syllogism. It's not exactly a regal example of a syllogism, but that's how you begin. You have this broad statement, like um, everyone in the family is expected to roller skate. I am a member of this family, and I have not broken my leg, Therefore, I will roller skate. So that's one way you can organize your argument or your presentation in your speech. Next, please.
Here's another much more common form of expression that you'll find. Um, it begins as a simple statement of fact, but a thesis can begin as a statement and it can be expanded into a PhD presentation for acquiring a doctorate in the postgraduate level of academics. But a thesis statement itself is a very simple structure that you will find in academic environments for sure. And again, the TOEFL is built to gauge how successful you will be in an academic setting or for professional credentialing. So this form of organization of thought is, is very common and it will always serve you well if you're going to be doing a presentation or speaking to someone about a position. A thesis statement, as you see on your screen, a thesis statement usually appears at the middle or the end of the introdu introductory paragraph of a paper and it offers a concise summary of the main point or claim of the essay or the research paper or the speech. It is usually expressed in one sentence and the statement may be reiterated elsewhere. So what you'll find in your textbooks is oftentimes they are structured around a thesis format of expression. Um, when I was going throughout school, both my, my you know, undergraduate degree as well as my master's degree, this never changed. If you read, if you open up your textbook, oftentimes like it, it, the initial part of it, the book will show you what is, it's all about and then there's the body of the book that'll show you more of it, and then there's a, conclusion, a concluding chapter. And the chapters themselves, though, are even built along this format. If you open up a chapter in a textbook, the first part of it says, this chapter will discuss this aspect. Then there's more in-depth information, and then there's a conclusion in the chapter to make sure you've got the sense of the idea that the author was wanting to convey. And if you were if you look at one page, you'll see the same format. You'll see, even in a paragraph, you'll see the same format. There is the first line is oftentimes, sometimes it's a, just an introductory hook. Um, it, it, it draws the attention of the audience, whether that is a listener or whether it is a reader. But then oftentimes you'll have the thesis sentence in the first line of the paragraph. Then the next two or three sentences will be supporting that idea. And then you have a conclusion in that same paragraph. This is why I said what I did, because of this. All right? So a thesis statement is a very, very appropriate strategy that you can use when you're doing your independent speaking. Okay, next please. Here is an, um, some more information. What I did is I actually took screenshots um, from my, my cell phone. I wanted you to see who developed this verbiage regarding you know, these concepts. I, I wanna make sure that I don't take the intellectual property or, or take credit for someone else's work. This is from, um, this is from a writer's, um, a writer's workshop at, I think it was University of Illinois. So um, a thesis statement focuses your ideas into one or two sentences. It should present the topic. I'm gonna change out paper and put speaks, speech here instead. So it should present the topic of your speech and also make a comment about your position in relation to that topic. Your thesis statement should tell your listener what your speech is about. And it also will help your speaking and keep your argument focused. Um, I will tell you that what I encountered when I was doing one of the drills that was on ETS's website regarding this, um, this uh, independent speaking, I found that um, I was not as organized as I could have been because I assumed it would be easy, so I jumped into it. And I spoke too quickly 
and I ended up having way too much time left on the other end of it. Um, so I was, tr again, trying to figure out some strategies that would help unbundle um, the success on this. And I think that this, again, I, I can learn from this. <laughs> I can learn from this. And I know that you can too. Next, please. Okay, here's how you develop your thesis, okay? Number one, state your topic. And what's gonna happen is when you're doing your independent speaking, um, you're gonna have 15 seconds to organize your thoughts. So you're gonna have a piece of paper and a pencil and you're, you can actually write down. So you're gonna state your topic. Uh, a very common one that I've seen in terms of drills, you might not get this question, but one I see commonly in the drills is tell us what you like to do in your leisure time and why. Simple. So then you would state, uh, pick, a, pick a topic, any topic, something that you like to do. What is your hobby? Are you into motocross? Um, are you into gardening? Are you into um, horseback riding? Are you into whatever? So you would state your, and this is for you when you're organizing, you simply state, what am I going to be talking about for yourself to organize? And then that helps you open up and unbundle the ideas you're going to want to give to your listener. So give the strongest reason, reason or assertion that supports your idea. So for example, I like to do this because I like to garden because. Give another strong reason. I like to garden because and I began gardening because, you know, um, as an example, I like to garden because it allows me to uh, come in direct contact with nature. Despite living in a city, I am an avid gardener. I don't have a large piece of land but I have containers on my patio and in my containers on my patio that overlooks um, the lagoon, I have corn and grapes and peaches and celery and um, lemons and, and mandarin oranges and you know, limes. And I, so I have lots of different things that I'm able to do despite living in the city. And the reason that I began to garden once upon a time was because my father, it was a time in my life that was very poignant and important when my father, um, I was taking care of him during the last years of his life. And I had a vision in my head that I wanted him to be able to sit outside in the cool of the day and enjoy the view he was very contemplative and I thought that a garden would allow him to relax and enjoy those moments. So that's why I began gardening. So there's two, I two ideas that I'm giving to support. I like to garden, yeah? And then you give, then you are able to just simply then say, and then this is why I garden. I developed a, a habit of it. I developed a taste for it. I had some unexpected enjoyment in the midst of it that ca I carry with me today. Yeah? All right. Now, as we're speaking, you start out with one idea. I like to garden or I like gardening. That is the simplest possible English sentence. I like to garden. Yeah? But what you can do in the middle of your speaking, you start with that idea but then you can add things that amplify your conversation, components to it, that you actually can prepare ahead of time. Um, for example, um, my, mom, my mom was raised in the South, and uh, she was raised in, in social environments that oftentimes were very formal. And um, one of the things that she was told when she was a young woman was to have phrases that you practiced so that you're not left knowing, not knowing what to say. 
And so there's some phrases that she has that can make her f look and appear very relaxed, very in control, elegant, not flustered, um, very eloquent. And I find that really intriguing. Um, one of the things that, I, from that, I've, I've learned some things too. For example, um, in, uh, for example, in a business conflict of some sort, in my culture, if you ask the word why, it can sometimes be viewed as a bit inflammatory. So instead of asking the word why of someone, I'll say, help me understand your position regarding this. And I have that phrase memorized. So if someone says something that I think is bonkers, <laughs> that, is, that is unwise, that, is, that makes no sense, that I disagree with strongly, also to be frank, I might need to have an education myself. I will give that qualifier. But what I will do is I want to open up the door to a conversation. And so what I will say is, help me to understand your position in this. And then there'll be a conversation, a dialogue. Well, that phrase I've learned and I've memorized and I'll bring it out when I need it. And you can actually do that when it comes to your speaking. For example, you can say, um, so they ask you the question, tell us what you do in your leisure time. You can say, it's interesting that you ask that question of me. And you start out with that, and that also buys you some time. <laughs> not that you're not going to answer the question, but it's an elegant way to enter into the conversation. And it sounds very polished, and it gives the impression of you being in control of the conversation. Again, I'm going back to this being an idea of a performance. And so if you have some portions of it that are habit to you, those will help you bookend things that are more extemporaneous. It's the extemporaneous conversation where we sometimes get stumbled, or we stumble around using myself as an example. So I wanted to let you know that. All right, uh, so next, please. This is another concept that you might want to apply depending on what is the question that they're going to be giving you. Those of you who have a journalism background will be very familiar with this. In English, we call it the five W's. Who, what, where, when, why. And sometimes we add how, which is an H. But for your ability to recall ideas that you want to convey to your listener when you're testing, who, what, where, when, why. And if you organize your thoughts in that way, that can completely consume the 45 seconds that are needed for you to complete the assignment. So using the same example, gardening. Who? I enjoy gardening more than any other hobby that I have. Who? What? Interestingly, even though I live in the city, I have a very extensive garden because I have developed container gardening strategies on my patios. Who, what, where? I began gardening a number of years ago when I was in a unique um, and poignant time in my life when I was taking care of my father in his last years. When? As of now, my father's gone, but the habit and the joy that I have developed in gardening remains with me. I, I take care of my garden, I tend it um, a few different times in the week, but also I feel like my garden tends me as well. There are times when I can sit and relax in the cool of the day as my father used to, and I can watch nature unfold around me. I can think about the lessons that I've learned in the garden and I can apply them to my own life. Why? See? Who, what, where, when, why? And you even can hold your hand out and remember to yourself who, what, where, when, why. You're allowed to have notes also 
when you're going to be doing your assessment. So, again, this is another way that you can help organize your thoughts for this presentation. Okay, next. All right. Here's another concept which might be able to give you, um, I think it's, I think actually it, it could help you. I do, I do think so. Um, there is a way that oftentimes politicians organize their sentences for maximum effect on the listener. And you're going to want to capture the attention of the listener. Yes? And this type of organization of your sentences in English does not require an extensive vocabulary. I know, and I'm the same way, I, as I told the class you last week, I'm in the process of learning Italian. And I'm frustrated with how little I know. And of the simple words that I have, I'm trying to grab from all different areas and form something that makes sense. Um, an example, um, in the past I actually, I, I, I know French, I've studied French, and I'm terribly rusty, but from time to time I'll pull it out for a reason and, and, and practice a bit and I become much more comfortable and fluent and, and I'm, I'm relaxed. But the vocabulary component still can be very frustrating because you come across against this brick wall and you have to figure out how to get your message out. Um, I have some dear friends from France, the Hortica family, Michel and his dear wife Dolores and their, their children, uh, Tweeny and Chelsea, they come, they come to visit here and they'll bring friends and, and, and family and it's a lovely time. And one time a few years ago, um, I was pretty new to the area actually and I had relatively recently met the Hortica family and they had brought some friends with them who wanted to learn how to surf and I live in I live near the beach in California and so I met with them for we had burgers on the pier over at uh, I think it was Seal Beach so we got together and the kids were talking about wanting to learn how to surf during that time I remembered that there was because of the time of year that they arrived there were a huge number of stingray um, injuries in that area, particularly in Seal Beach, because there, for whatever reason, there was a population explosion of the stingray pups. I guess they're called pups. And so there were so many, there were a number of stingray stings from surfers and swimmers in that area, and they wanted to swim there. So. I was trying to tell them to be careful, and you, you're supposed to walk a certain way when you're, when you're in the water when there's stingrays. You basically slide your feet so because you don't go up and, and away instead of you accidentally stepping on them and them stinging you. So I was trying to explain to them about the concern and the danger, how to protect themselves if they're going to be taking surfing lessons from stingrays. And I didn't have the word for stingray. I didn't know what the word stingray was in French. At the time, I also didn't know the word for shark. <laughs> anyway, but um, so I was trying to tell them how to protect themselves against stingrays. And I had to pick words that I had. And so basically in English, but in French, I said, but then the English translation was, be careful because there are fish like angels with a poison behind. <laughs> That's the only way I knew how to say it. Fish like angels like a, with a poison behind. And so because they had a stinger and they were like angels and they said, oh, en ray, so they knew, right, very simple. Ray was the same word, but I didn't know that. But I was able to piece together in a very clumsy way, ultimately successful though, on what I was trying to tell them. You'll find that you are doing that yourself too. You don't have to have an extravagant vocabulary, however, to be successful on the TOEFL. You're able to navigate comfortably in communication, oftentimes with very simple words. And you can do things in a very dense, um, weighty, 
interesting way with sometimes very simple words. What I have posted here on your, on your slides, I think I posted this a couple of days ago, was an interesting essay um, from a famous and controversial American comedian who has, has since passed away. The, he wrote this fairly soon after his wife died, and he actually followed her um, fairly soon after this as well, so he passed really relatively close to his wife. But I thought it was interesting um, in the way he put together his sentences, and it's a strategy that you can use as well. Um, so the paradox of our time in history is that we have taller buildings but shorter temperature, tem tempers. We have wider freeways but narrower viewpoints. We spend more but we have less. We buy more but we enjoy less. We have bigger houses and smaller families, more conveniences but less time. We have more degrees but less sense more medicine but less wellness so you see what he's doing all of those words are very simple english words but what he's describing is a significantly important cultural dynamic that we are facing at it where where i am perhaps you are as well but there's this polarization and there is there is a, a lack of of quality oftentimes in the choices that we make in our lives that lead to quantity instead of quality. And he was pointing this out, I thought, in a very interesting way. And he would say, we have this, but not this. And many times what you will do when you're developing your English vocabulary is to help you mnemonically be able to sort it and store it for recall, is that you'll learn one word and then you'll learn the opposite, the contrasting word as well. And so you'll pair those words together so that you'll be able to recall more easily. It's a, um, it's a, it's a very common way that you're developing your vocabulary. So if you're doing that, then this type of structure in a sentence can serve you very well. Um, if you take this all the way down, the bottom of this essay I think is interesting. It says, always remember, Life is not measured by the number of breaths that we take, but by those moments that take our breath away. The reason why I'm pointing that out is that I think that that is a very interesting quote. And it's a quote that I could, I could put into my memory. And in a speaking moment, I actually could pull out that quote and use it as part of my speaking. For example, in gardening, I could even close with that. And even, if I don't remember it precisely, rather than saying, to quote George Carlin, life is not measured by the number of breaths that we take, but by those moments that take our breath away, what I could do if I don't remember that precisely, I could say in English, well, to paraphrase George Carlin, which means you're not quoting him directly, but you're wanting to convey the sense of what he said. I could say, to paraphrase George Carlin, um, our life is not made up of all the breaths that we take, but, but there is filled instead with moments that make us breathless. You know, so if I don't remember the quote exactly, and if you want to quote an author or a famous person, and you're not quite sure of who that is, but you want to bring it into your speech, you actually can do that by saying, to paraphrase. All right. So from this essay, again, I thought it was fascinating. It's, I think for you to read it, it's a, good, it's a good essay just to get a sense of our culture here in America, if you're planning on coming to America, as opposed to a different English-speaking culture. I believe that these are, these are the, the, the concerns that we have now in our culture, and I believe that this is, this is what we're going to be working towards getting better at. Right? All right. So from this, there are two things to pull. Number one is that with very simple vocabulary, you can create a structure of this, this bilateral structure in your sentences that conveys deep meaning. Plus, you can pull quotes that you can use in your presentation. And you can say, if you know it exactly because it's memorized, you can say, to quote Whitney Farmer, which I doubt you will, but to quote George Carlin, 
and if you don't exactly remember what it was because of the moment you have gone a bit blank because of the nerves because you're human you can say to paraphrase George Carlin yes all right I want to show you a couple of different things now next please okay this I'm going to speak about a little bit later but right now I want to do some work on the board here because I want you to see a couple of different things. First of all, one of the things that I noticed about myself when I was doing, when I was doing my drills on ETS for the, uh, the speaking, the independent speaking, is that I didn't answer their initial question when I was doing it myself. And if you look at the rubrics that I, that I sent over onto, our, onto the Facebook as well as to WhatsApp, you'll notice that on the zero, there's actually the ability to get a zero on this if you don't answer the question, right? So first of all, number one, follow the follow the directions and this is something that those of you who have more English competency you actually might have a more of a difficult time with this than someone who's more of a new acquirer of the English language. And the reason is, is that your own imagination can start running ahead. And so you're beginning to think with idiomatic fluency. And because there's idiomatic fluency, you might start having a conversation in your own imagination as you're in the middle of the testing moment and realize that you're not following directions. So the directions that are given on the test are very simple. And so do what they're telling you to do. Once, once um, I actually had a fascinating class when I was an undergrad of all things. It's called Economic Geography. And it was, a, it was a fascinating class and I loved the professor. One of his tests, it was a very large class. So one of his tests, you know, it couldn't all be essay, it couldn't all be, you know, very individualized performance. Some of it had to be very very cut and dry quantitative. One section of a test had a true false section. There were 10 questions on this one part of a test and then other essays and such. But in this section, it was true and false. And he wrote the instructions to me and to all the other students said, write true or false beside each statement. So there would be like a statement of you know, some, some economic geography fact or, fal or fallacy. And then my job as a student was to write true or false. Well, I become in the habit, because of going to school for a number of years, of writing a T or an F, not writing out true or false. So what happened was, when I took that test, I had a perfect score on the whole test, the whole test, all the part, I, I was the top student in that class, except for that part of that test where he told me to write true and false, and I wrote a T for true and an F for false instead of the whole word. He took off half of the credit for every single one of those questions. I would have had a perfect score on the entire test, except I did not follow the directions. So this is something that I, to this day, I have to be careful of. I have to, when you're testing, you're nervous. And when you're nervous, your imagination can kick in and there's a heightened energy and that can keep you from paying attention to the small points. If you simply follow the directions, that is a huge part of what will feed into your success. All right? Second. OK. 
Okay. Choose something familiar. What I mean by this is you're the one who's going to be speaking and perhaps you've heard um, something on the news that morning and but it's not deeply embedded and you're gonna have to speak for 45 seconds and it sounds like it's not a lot of time but it actually is. So if for example they say speak about what you like to do in your leisure time. And what if you um, were thinking about doing a new, a new thing, you, or you did once, you did something once, like I just started to play the ukulele. Um, so I'm just starting to play the ukulele in my leisure time. But you don't know very much about it, so that might not be what you'd want to speak about. If in my leisure time I am a gardener and I have a wealth of experience from that and a number of reasons why I do it, that might be a better choice for me. The nice thing about the independent speaking section is that you are in charge. I want you to shift your perspective and think about that reality, that truth. When you are speaking, you are in charge. So that means you can choose your topic and you can then convey what you want that listener to know about your opinions, your experiences, yourself, all right? So choose something that's familiar to you. It doesn't matter if it's not familiar to anybody else. That might be part of the joy of it, explaining to them why it's interesting to you. Yeah? The first time I planted a garden for my father, I, had, I just threw some sunflower seeds in, in this very small area. One of the sunflowers grew to be seven feet tall. <laughs> it was very unexpected. And I looked at the package and it wasn't supposed to do that, but it did that. And the face of this sunflower was this big. And so I started researching sunflowers and I started finding out about the history of them and how they came first from here, then to Europe and then back. And then from you know the 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 Fibonacci sequence that's 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 you know the the way the seeds are organized in the face of a sunflower and why they're called sunflower and tournasol or tornasol tornasol in French or tornasol in Spanish and how they turn their face to meet the sun and how the Fibonacci sequence is called the fingerprint of God because it is a mathematical sequence that appears throughout nature whether it's from our fingerprint or to a spiral galaxy. I mean, this started with me beginning to throw some sunflower seeds in the dirt, yeah? So that's something I'm familiar with. And if someone wants me to talk about it, I can do that. So I would do that. So pick something that also, I think you just saw I have a little bit of passion, yeah? Pick something that you're also passionate about. Because in the midst of your passion, that helps to disengage and get rid of some of your fear. I remember when I was first learning French, the first time that I had a flow of concentration as I was listening to someone, before that moment, each time I would listen to someone speak French, I'd listen to them and in my head I'd try to translate, 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 and so there was not a relaxed listener attention that I could give to them. Well, in second year of French in college, the professor began to, didn't even explain to us why he was doing it, but he began to just simply lecture on art history, and he began to lecture on the Impressionist movement, and in France, and at that time in my life, I was, um, I was, th that was very interesting to me. I had recently come back from France, and I had seen for the first time, face to face, some of these amazing, magnificent works of art, 
And so it was very, uh, it was very exciting to me to hear him speak. And what happened was because the content, the topic was so interesting to me, I began simply to listen to him. And I realized at the end of his lecture on art history, but in my French class, I realized that I had started listening in a completely different way. I had stopped translating. And I started, had, I had started to develop, I maybe at that moment, in my recollection, in that moment, idiomatic fluency. So my brain was not having to do that extra calculation. My brain was simply receiving the data, receiving the word, and understanding, right? So if you're familiar with something, you'll be able to speak with passion about something, and that can help disengage some of the fear you have and of, of the speaking moment, of the testing moment. And when that happens, then if you come across a word that you don't know, you're trying to recall or trying to describe a stingray or a shark or, or a sunflower, what will happen is your imagination, because it's not fettered and captivated by fear, your imagination can step in and can help you out and can help you bring in a number of ingredients in the language to succeed at conveying your message. Make sense? Okay, next. Um, then this is what we have been talking about. After you do this, yeah? And this is where I will never outgrow this moment, neither will you. We can all do this from now until the end, yeah? Organize your thoughts. Oops, I think I'm going too far over there. Hang on. I think I'm too far that way, so. Better? Okay. Simply organize your thoughts. And some strategies we talked about were syllogism, thesis format, or the five W's. These are just some ideas, but I'm sure you might have others as well, but I think these might serve you very well, okay? And then another thing I would like you to do, this is a test for higher education, professional credentialing, academic uh, performance. So therefore, a number of you want to speak more with native speakers, which I definitely understand that, but you don't need to worry about idiomatic expressions or slang or any of the things that make your daily life more comfortable and help you form bonds wi within your community if you now or plan to reside in an English-speaking community. Those kinds of casual ways of saying things are great. They're wonderful. They can help you at the gas station when you're trying to get, it, get your favorite kind of candy or what have you. Someone was telling me about that. So that's good, but that's not what you need to worry about in this test. This is a formal environment. So many of you might find this part more easier than others. Some languages, the way your phrases are built, tend to be more formal. That actually can help you in this environment. I believe Arabic is this way. If you are speaking in English, but you come from an Arabic speaking um, environment, I think that you'll do very well in this circumstance. Speak more formally. Speak formally. Don't worry about slang. Don't worry about idiomatic expressions. Don't worry about accents of particular areas. Um, if you speak formally, that can do very well for you in this test. Yes? Okay. And then last, but not least, and I was trying to think of a way to say this. I'm just saying, sell it. Sell it. 
whatever you're speaking, this is a performance. So what you want to do is make sure you capture that listener. And if you're speaking of, about something that's passionate, that you have experience with, even if you don't have all the words, you can sell it. You can draw the listener in. You can captivate and therefore score successfully. So if you want to say sell it or preach it, however you want to say it, that is where your skills as a speaker can close the deal for you, as we say in English, okay? Now, I want to tell you one more thing over here. All right, um, back to your slides. Um, I'm going to be closing up pretty quickly, but I wanted to go over a couple of resources for you to make sure that you're taking advantage of everything that's out there, okay? Um, ETS, on their website, ETS.org, has launched a new MOOC. And a MOOC, M-O-O-C, is an acronym for Massive Open Online Class, okay? And so this MOOC is beginning right now, and it's free. You can enroll right now. So go on to ETS's website, ETS.org, and look through there. And this is a screen capture for um, that portion of their site. Um, and again, it's free. As many resources that are out there that are free, I'm going to give to you. If you want to pay money for things, be blessed and do so. <laughs> you don't have to, okay? So this is a free, web, uh, free resource to look at. And next, please. What this class will develop for you, um, what it will give to you, actually I think can give you an additional credential too, um, that you can, some of your work's interesting. Okay, yeah. So it's six weeks in length, two to four hours per week. It's free. If you want to add a verified certificate for your participation, you actually can pay a fee for that. Um, I, but it's not necessary to participate. And some of your professions wouldn't even require a valid certificate anyway. But if you do want to participate in that manner in a formal way, you can purchase um, that opportunity with a verified certificate for $49 US. All right, um, so this gives you the information about that. Okay, so look into that. I think it might be beneficial to you. Next, please. Okay. Our next class um, is going to be one week from today, not at one o'clock in the morning. Our next class will instead be at a much more civilized hour of 11.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. will be one hour until 12.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And we're going to be, I th I'm going to continue on with the speaking portion. We're going to go into the integrated speaking portion. That way you'll be able to start working now on this part of the test, which has been most challenging for the majority of you. So while you're learning all of the other things, this speaking will also be able to overlap all of that and be fed by all the other skills that you're developing in your, in your listening and your reading and your writing. All of those skills are going to feed into this together. So you're going to be, you yourself will be integrated as you begin to integrate your speaking in English. So I would like to tell you again, um, I am so grateful that you're here today. I'm so grateful that you've allowed us to be a part of what you're doing for yourself and your family and your future. Um, to all of you, thank you for your time and may peace be with you.